Modern Death by Hater War Age How Death is Negotiated Sven was a medical student from Germany who had come to my hospital to do an elective rotation. He had a tall and thin frame, would wear checked shirts and suede shoes without fail, and was never seen with a belt. In addition to the usual stuff medical students carry, stethoscope, pocket textbook, reflex hammer, tuning fork, etc., he carried a small stout book that he would consult very frequently. It was an English to German medical dictionary. Sven had come all the way from Frankfurt, and I really wanted to show him something unique about American medicine. Germany, of course, has all the shiny toys we have, the most advanced cardiac catheters and devices, the most fancy robotic surgeries, shiny hospitals, crisp lab coats, and what not. If anything, German medicine is way ahead of the United States in having far superior medical outcomes on a population-based level. After much thought, I figured out that there was one thing I could not deprive him of which was quintessentially American, I took him to a family meeting. The patient was an elderly lady who had come in from New Hampshire. Everything started after she had a heart attack. She came to the hospital but was found to be in mulchy organ failure. Too sick to get a cardiac catheterization, she was stabilized in the ICU her heart was so weak it wasn't really beating. It was quivering just enough to get a fraction of the required amount of blood pumping. Her kidneys, too, were barely functioning at this point, and were unable to filter the body's toxins. The ICU team had emergently started dialysis at the bedside, to help lend a hand to her dying kidneys. The hope was that whatever had caused her kidneys to come to a standstill would dissipate and that she would not require dialysis long term. Days became weeks and it seemed that her kidneys were done for. Dialysis was a bridge to nowhere. Increasingly, her clinical state became an untenable band-aid at best. Because her heart was so weak, every time she was on dialysis her blood pressure would drop to dangerous levels. Things had reached the point where the dialysis unit staff felt uncomfortable even trying dialysis, given how she was not tolerating it at all. The status quo had become very tenuous and I felt that it was time to meet the family and discuss what the course going forward ought to be. Back when the patient was first admitted, her husband had brought in a wrinkled piece of paper, it was her living will. On that piece of paper, she had blackened out the square next to the option indicating that she would not want CPR or mechanical ventilation. To me, the form was not very useful. It didn't tell me what circumstance she had signed the form in what she knew about these procedures, or what she considered a good death. As we were weighing the competing risks of depriving her brain of oxygen by performing dialysis or letting unfiltered toxins accumulate in her system, I learned nothing about what she would want at that very moment. It was for just this type of a moment that society, judiciary, and medicine came up with a solution. A patient, in addition to having a document that would carry forward their wishes should they become incapacitated, would appoint a person who would serve as their voice should they be unable to fully comprehend the prevailing clinical situation or participate in any meaningful way. That person, also referred to as a healthcare proxy, would be someone who not only would have the patient's best interest front and center, but also would be able to relay what the patient would say or decide in any situation. Thankfully, my patient had already designated her husband as her healthcare proxy. So I called him on the phone and let him know that the team wanted to meet him. He told us that his two daughters would also be at the meeting. I asked Svent to page all the people who needed to be at the meeting, the cardiologist, who could talk about the heart failure, the nephrologist, to discuss the dialysis, the social worker, who knew the family very well, and of course the other members of our medical team, who were primarily taking care of her on a day-to-day -day basis. When we entered the room, the patient was looking at the ceiling, mouth open, saying nothing. I surveyed the room to find one daughter, the younger, leaning over her mother and crying, while the older sister was looking out the window, and the father was sitting on a chair clutching his hat. After the customary introductions, I tried to orchestrate a digestible update of the situation for the family, starting with the cardiologist, who told them that her heart was still as weak as ever and there was little we could do for it and ending with the nephrologist, 
who told the family that at this point continuing with dialysis would do more harm than good. He concluded by saying that he would recommend withdrawing dialysis. The older daughter, who referred to herself frequently as the meanie, was the pessimist who seemed to agree with our recommendation. She kept saying how she also believed that at this time, doing more was in fact going to only bring more harm upon her. But she was struggling, sometimes I wake up at night thinking that not doing more would be like killing her. The younger one, though, rarely left her mother's side, and she was decidedly stricken by the situation. She was crying, laughing, trying to talk to her mother, and from time to time would interrupt the conversation after prematurely and incorrectly discovering that her mother was alert and oriented. She wasn't really listening to anyone, but would frequently let us know how we all hated her mother, how we were tired of taking care of her and just wanted to get rid of her. She was her mother's favorite, she told us, and even though she knew she wasn't the healthcare proxy, she knew it was she who loved her most. Outside the room, from nowhere, a blizzard had taken hold. I vividly remember the wind blowing snow in all directions other than down. I could see swirls of snow climb the maroon walls against a gray desaturated background. The father was the proxy, and he was almost shaking. Not only was he burdened by being the tiebreaker, but the entire situation was just overwhelming for him. I feel like my heart and my mind are at war, he told us. My mind knows it is futile but my heart wants her to not die and leave us. I looked around the room, and tension was hanging in the air like industrial grade smog. I looked at Sven, and he was red as a beet, I could tell that this was not something he was used to back in Germany. Any more stress and I thought he would start bleeding out of his eyes. What we felt was of course nothing compared with what the family members were feeling. They had taken care of their mother for many years as her body grew weaker, but this was not only a different ball game. It was a completely different sport. I just don't have it in me to pull the plug, the father told us. Being a healthcare proxy is one of the hardest things one can be nominated to be. In caregiving, no matter what one does, the disease wins, and such is the proxy's paradox as well. At best, a healthcare proxy can ensure that his or her loved one is able to achieve a reasonable death, for it is only then that the proxy can graduate. A proxy never faces any easy questions, when doctors have a good solution, a proxy's role is straightforward and superficial, it is only when we are stuck with two bad options that we really need a proxy's deciding vote. Knowing what I know now, I can say that almost no one who signs up to be a healthcare proxy for a friend or a family member has any idea what he or she is getting into. The role of a healthcare proxy is a derivative of modern technological advances for many reasons. Previously, before evidence-based medicine became widely practiced, doctors could do little that would change a patient's outcome in any meaningful way. This was back when pharmacies still dispensed leeches over the counter. When we first learned the sort of tricks of the trade that are our staple to this day, antibiotics, surgery, vaccines, etc. We were too arrogant to consider a patient or his or her family member a voice worth listening to. There were also few situations in which a patient could not participate in his or her own medical decision making, patients were either fully alive or fully dead. Death was swift and fast and there was almost no time for dialogues to occur. All roads, though, lead through the Karen and Quinlan case which first highlighted on a national level just how much the process of dying had evolved. Situations such as those involving the Quinlans had been popping up ever since the advent of mechanical ventilators and CPR but had never been featured on the front pages of newspapers. How physicians dealt with these situations prior to it surfacing naturally was truly ad hoc and extempore, sometimes they would reach an agreement with patients' families and other times they would go and make important decisions without their express consent. The patient autonomy revolution, however, came at just the right time to turn things in the right direction before patients' rights were usurped for good. Advanced directives were developed to extend patients' autonomy beyond the persistence of their own ability in order to provide prospective autonomy to patients. Advanced directives therefore allowed patients to define their treatment preferences even when they were not physically or cognitively able to state them. The myriad shortcomings of living wills, however, 
resulted in the origin of healthcare proxies, also called surrogates. The first requisite for a proxy to be activated is if a patient in fact cannot make decisions for themselves. This means that patients have to lack what is called in medical lingo capacity. Capacity is the ability of adults to possess insight into their medical and psychological state, to understand the various treatment options they may have and comprehend the consequences of not proceeding with recommended management, and then lastly to communicate their thoughts to others. Capacity evaluation for which I always seek expert psychiatric consultation, is a spot check. A patient does not indefinitely lose capacity but needs to have capacity evaluated for each and every decision a physician feels is due to impaired cognition. For example, if a suicidal patient wants to leave the hospital emergently, I can have the psychiatrists make a capacity evaluation at that moment, but any subsequent attempts to leave would need a new capacity evaluation. While many physicians assume that patients don't have capacity when they disagree with them, patients merely need an internally consistent mental machinery to demonstrate capacity. People are allowed to make stupid decisions that may not be in their best interest as long as they retain the brains needed to understand that. However, some patients will defer important decision-making to surrogates even when they retain capacity. States have varying levels of formal requirements for what it takes for a patient to be able to officially nominate someone as their proxy. While some require documents to be filled out in the presence of a notary, increasingly, especially to confer healthcare decision making, patients can appoint one of their family or friends as a proxy with a minimum amount of paperwork and just two informal witnesses. It's probably for the best that nomination of a surrogate should be easy for patients. Hospitals bombard patients with forms, materials, and junk mail, much of which is lawyer-authored or lawyer-mandated spam. Increasingly during the course of my training, I realized that the healthcare proxy nomination is most crucial to patients retaining their autonomy. While I improved my practice to have people fill out forms even when I am being pulled in myriad other directions, national rates for nominating surrogates remain depressingly low. In one study from an ICU in New York, among critically ill patients, who need surrogate decision-making more than perhaps any other group, less than one in five patients had nominated agents. Numbers in other studies aren't much higher. Once healthcare proxies have been nominated, they come into play when patients lose capacity. They lose their executive function when the patient regains capacity. But while they wear the crown of thorns the scope of their powers is as vast as that of the patients themselves. All consents go through them, all lab tests and results are reported to them first, and all decisions require their affirmation. The principles underlying surrogate judgment, though, are not very well understood, even by those bestowed with this great responsibility. If the patient has let their preferences be known in any material fashion, their proxy is obliged to follow those instructions. This tenet of proxy decision-making is called subjective standard, meaning that if a patient has filled out an advance directive, their proxy is only loosely required to follow those instructions. In most cases, proxies agree with wishes patients may have put down in a living will, and this combination makes for a powerful and persuasive statement. When surrogates and living wills agree, Physicians are more than 95% likely to agree as well with the patient's preferences. However, there are instances when agents disagree with what may have been written by a patient in a will. This is a physician's nightmare. Living wills are imperfect but represent the patient's own actual preferences, albeit without any context whatsoever. The healthcare proxy is not a form, it is an actual living person, reacting to all the information around them and frequently advocating for the patient and or for the decision they think is best for the patient. Both are powerful in their own right. While this does not come up too often, it places the doctor in a pickle. When physicians in Switzerland were presented with clinical vignettes that showed a disagreement between the surrogate and the living will, physicians were twice as likely to opt for the less aggressive option. When no evidence can be relied upon to guide decision-making for surrogates, they are required to use the best interest standard. What this means is that if a patient left no evidence, whether material or circumstantial, about what their preference would be in a certain situation, 
surrogates need to shift their focus from patient autonomy to patient well-being. In this situation, therefore, surrogates need to think more like objective onlookers, that is, the way physicians are technically supposed to think. Best interest requires surrogates to take into account how sick or debilitated the patient is, what the prognosis is, what the available options are, what degree of benefit the possible treatments offer, how much the patient will suffer in undergoing said treatments, and whether the benefits outweigh the possible harms. The vast majority of situations at the end of life do not involve the subjective standard or the best interest standard. Because advanced directives are so rarely filled out, subjective standard rarely comes up, and when it does, it is rarely contested. Best interest matters mostly either in children or when the proxy has really no information about or relationship with the patient, which is uncommon. This leaves the vast majority of decision making under the shadow of the controversial umbrella of substituted judgment. Patients look to anyone in a white coat, whether a medical student, a senior physician, or even a pharmacist, for answers to fairly complex questions. Frequently much rides on the answers we give, life or death is certainly up there, but healthcare decisions also have a great domino effect on finances. Medical bills are the single greatest cause of bankruptcy in the United States, affecting 2 million Americans annually. How every question is answered affects how caregivers make important decisions, which makes almost every response high stakes. I have been asked a lot of difficult questions, how long does my sister have to live? What are the chances my son will come out of this procedure alive? Will my father ever walk again? The hardest question, however, has always been, Doc, if this were your mother, what would you do? This question is at once one of the smartest things a patient's loved one can ask a physician as well as one of the least. Doctors can frequently come across as android-like to patients, their responses don't reflect the sort of emotions that family and friends feel. Physicians over-rely on numbers and percentages and technical terms when talking to caregivers, which can make them appear perhaps rightfully, aloof. Bringing up a physician's own family member, and using that as a prism to suffuse a physician's thoughts with emotion, makes sense given that it's a foolproof means to squeeze the humanity out of almost anyone. On the other hand, though, this question goes against the central concept lying at the heart of the role of a healthcare agent, substituted judgment. This principle truly encapsulates what a healthcare proxy's role is. A healthcare proxy is someone who extends a patient's voice to when the patient himself is voiceless. Their role is to provide physicians information about what a patient would have wanted were they capable of voicing that desire meaningfully. The expectation is that they will use whatever knowledge they have of the patient's preferences and values, personal, spiritual, medical, and ethical, to guesstimate what the patient's opinion would have been in a given situation. Therefore, in an interesting twist, after a patient loses capacity the most important answers don't come from physicians but from the agent's patients appoint for themselves. Substituted judgment therefore requires proxies to make a prediction, something human beings are terrible at. We are terrible on a large societal level at predicting political, financial, and sporting trends, and we are worse at an individual level. In their paper, titled The Failure of the Living Will, Angela Fodgerlin and Carl Schneider write, people mispredict what posters they will like, how much they will buy at the grocery store, how sublimely they will enjoy an ice cream, and how they will adjust to tenure decisions. Startling data shows that paraplegics aren't much sadder and lottery winners aren't much happier than anyone else. While paraplegics suffer initially after the incident that caused them the function of their legs, within just a few weeks their predominant view of their lives is positive. This, of course, while extremely counterintuitive, demonstrates how much our imaginations can lead us astray. Too frequently we paint an incorrect and incomplete picture of future events too lush or too muted. So, for example, while Midwesterners attribute their woes to not living in a warmer and more culturally rich area like Southern California, in reality their life satisfaction does not differ much from actual matched Californians. Patients are not that great at predicting their own future preferences and decisions. So you can imagine that when someone else is predicting patients' preferences on their behalf, inaccuracy would be rife. 
One study published in the Annals of Internal Medicine is particularly illuminating. In this meta-analysis, the authors compiled results from all the well-designed studies looking at how well surrogates compared with the patients themselves and accurately predicting what their treatment preferences might be. Surprisingly, just 68% of agents were able to accurately predict what decisions patients would make in a multitude of different situations ranging from surgery to antibiotics. When the patient suffered from dementia or stroke, they were only accurate 58% of the time. While three studies demonstrated that surrogates were more likely to want more treatment than the patients themselves, only one study showed surrogates withholding treatment the patient would have preferred, suggesting that surrogates tend to be more aggressive about care they are not receiving themselves than the patients who end up receiving the care. Interestingly, surrogates who had been selected by the patients themselves were no better than those that had been arbitrarily appointed by the physicians. The position that proxies occupy is compounded by the fact that frequently patients themselves don't know what they would want in a future kerfuffle. More than half of all patients change their decisions about treatments they would want over a two-year period, when researchers from Chapel Hill and Seattle studied around 2,000 elderly patients, they found that over two years, on average there was a trend toward patients wanting less aggressive treatment. In fact, Patients who wanted the least amount of treatment at the start of the two years were the most stable group, with 85% still wanting the same after two years. Patients who wanted the most aggressive treatment were most likely to change their minds, and after two years more of this group was likely to be in the least treatment preference group than those who still wanted most treatment. Patients who leaned toward more treatment after two years were poorer, were more depressed, and were less likely to have health insurance though they were not actually sicker than patients who leaned toward less aggressive management. This data, and multiple other studies that found surrogates to be no more accurate than flipping a coin, has caused a significant number of ethicists, physicians, and philosophers to cast doubt on the viability of substituted judgment, which makes for great ethical theory but is almost impossible to replicate in an actual clinical setting. The holy grail of end-of-life decision-making substituted judgment, is drilled into the heads of unsuspecting medical students and residents, with little if any education about its shaky foundation. The question then is why we choose to continue to carry on with our reliance on substituted judgment to help guide conversations at the end of life. Perhaps the most important reason we continue to ask proxies to channel their loved ones is that we really haven't come up with any other alternative. Physicians tend to fare even worse than proxies at predicting patient preferences. Furthermore, given that making these important calls is tough on patients, when surrogates believe they are merely voicing someone else's desires, erroneous as they might be, they feel less vulnerable to the burdens of such crucial pronouncements as opposed to when they are solely required to be the deciders. While doctors may not have the answer to the question what does Mr. or Mrs. Smith want? There's much they can do to help the Smiths reach that answer in the best possible fashion. Traditionally, doctors always told the Smiths what Mr. or Mrs. Smith should have been thinking. More recently, physicians have been told to ask the anointed Smith to predict what Mr. or Mrs. Smith would want were they able to verbalize their desired treatment. These conversations usually cause more harm than good. Physicians and family members frequently end up talking about separate, disparate procedures as if they are putting together a sandwich at Subway. So now when someone asks me the question Doc, if this were your mother, what would you do? I don't just reflexively blurt out what my own personal preference in that situation might be. Like the vast majority of people, I have never had an explicit discussion about what sort of specific life-sustaining interventions my mother would personally want for herself if they were up for consideration. But over the few decades we have spent together, I have learned a few things about her. She loves food, babies, and embroidered clothes in no particular order. What she loves more than anything else, though, are her children, and I know that the highlight of her day is being able to talk or Skype with me or one of my siblings even for a few minutes. I know her enough to know that no matter what, she would want more time, and it would be worth it for her. No two parents are the same though. So, back in that room on that stormy day, where I was standing next to Sven, with the two daughters and the father, 
with the elderly woman whose heart and kidneys had both decided to tank, and the older daughter asked me what I would do if this were my parent, I knew it was my cue to take this conversation where it needed to go. We had spent too much time talking about her dialysis, about her blood pressure, about her medications, but I still didn't feel like I knew anything meaningful about the person hiding inside my patient. Why don't you tell me more about your mother? I asked. The family looked at each other as if they really were caught off guard, so I continued, I feel like we have spoken so much about her yet I really don't feel like I know her too well. As if on cue, the daughter started talking, this family's matriarch was perhaps one of the kindest people ever. She never heard a bee, or aunt, the older daughter told us. Perhaps her favorite thing was to make meals for those she loved. She was so warm, we were told that she would invite strangers over to her home to make them dinner. Finally, the younger daughter, who had failed at holding back her tears, said, she taught me everything I know, but never this. As her voice trailed off, the room had taken a different feel. I couldn't believe my eyes, almost as if I were living a cliché, but the storm had cleared and it was ridiculously bright outside. The goodness of the woman had removed all of the tension that had preceded it. I asked them. What was the one thing you would say was the most important for her to do? The father, who had thus far been quiet throughout, spoke up. To her, a life in which she couldn't cook up a feast or go out with her friends would not be worth living. They weren't expecting us to say anything, because it seemed like the answers they had sought from us had become self-evident through their own stories. They knew she wouldn't be able to cook at home anymore and they knew how important cooking was to her. They knew now that she wouldn't want to stay indefinitely in the hospital, shuttling between the ward and the ICU as she struggled to just get by. The family finally came to the conclusion that perhaps taking the focus away from aggressive and life-extending treatments was the course she would have opted for. When I stepped out of the patient's room with the rest of the team, we all felt relief that the meeting had gone well after a rocky start. I looked around and saw Sven standing behind everyone. I went up to him to find him flushed, with watery eyes and all. He said, I have never experienced anything this intense before. Perhaps what is more crucial than patients picking what treatment they would want, where they would like to die, and when would they want to not pursue further interventions is who they would want to make choices for them when they are incapacitated. Mostly, though, patients appoint surrogates without giving their choice the kind of thought it needs. The question then is, who makes a great healthcare proxy? To answer this question, it's worth reiterating what the role of a proxy is. A proxy has two primary roles. In the first, they are supposed to follow wishes patients may have expressed or implied about how they would like to live out the end of their lives. In the second, when they lack any evidence whatsoever, actual or circumstantial, they need to think about what would be in the patient's best interest based on accepted medical standards. To be able to help forecast a patient's thoughts, a surrogate has to be someone who knows the patient intimately. The relationship a proxy has with the patient is thus of paramount importance in the selection process. Vincent was only 42 years old when he had a massive bleed in his brain, lost his pulse, and received CPR thrice. While his heart regained some function, his brain didn't. A CAT scan revealed that his brain had become so gooey and swollen that it was starting to push its way out through his skull. His doctors performed neurologic testing on him and found him to be brain dead. Doctors were moving towards removing Vincent from the ventilator when his extensive and complicated social history surfaced. Raised with ten adopted siblings, Vincent now was survived by two ex-wives and five children, two of whom were adult sons. Both of his sons Ted and Will, were 21 years old. Will was estranged from his father and hadn't spoken to him in years. Ted knew Vincent well, but Ted was born from an affair Vincent's wife had when she was still married to him. Will was blood on paper but a stranger in the flesh, while Ted was raised by Vincent as a son, though he shared none of his DNA. In this case, Vincent's doctors rightly assigned Ted as the decision maker, highlighting the importance of bond over blood. An ideal agent would also be someone who, when faced with untouched territory, would be able to adjudicate what lies in a patient's best interest, 
This is much harder than it seems and is perhaps where most proxies stumble in carrying out their responsibilities. One issue with best interest is that it risks harking back to the paternalism of medical practice in prior times. In an article in The Atlantic, published November 6, 2013, titled My Mother Deserved to Die Comfortably, a writer described the difficult course her mother endured during her prolonged struggle with lung cancer. The writer described a tense relationship with her father, who was the primary caregiver of the mother, and was at her side at all times. However, he had thrown a shroud of denial around his wife, as he attempted to shield her from all bad news and her grim prognosis. To him, it was in his wife's best interest to have as much hope as possible, and to do everything possible to prolong her life. The daughter could not bear the sight of her mother so miserable, frowning up at the ceiling, mouth ajar as if to cry out. In one instance, while she was not her mother's healthcare proxy, she filled out an advance directive on her mother's behalf in which she stated she did not want any further treatment. This, to the daughter, was in her mother's best interest but nowhere did she mention anything about what her mother herself wanted, what she valued, what she would have said were she able to say so. The best proxies are those who have a way of homing in on what the patient valued above all other things. One moment I will never forget came one day when a patient with chronic lung disease from emphysema was admitted to the ICU with worsening of his lung disease. I went about with my usual history taking, with the family at the bedside. He was accompanied by his entire family, his daughter was the healthcare proxy and she was the one driving the boat. Her father wasn't saying much, he was wearing a Red Sox shirt, so I figured I could talk about that. He had an encyclopedic knowledge of the woes of our team that had led to their season being cut short just a few days ago. Beyond baseball, though, the patient knew very little about why he was in the hospital, what time of year it was or even where he was at that point. The only thing he still knows about are the socks, his daughter confirmed. When the question about his preferences for life-sustaining treatments arose, the daughter spoke up, with the baseball season over, he has nothing to look forward to. I had never heard a preference quite like this, but the moment I did, its earnestness made sense. We discolated care immediately. A proxy may be very close to the patient but may not necessarily be able to judge what is in their best interest. When I think of myself, I know that no one knows me as well as my wife. For many years, we have shared every intimate detail one can imagine, and I trust completely that if anyone were to forecast what I would want or how I would react in any given situation, she would do as good a job as any. Yet if a time were to come when she could no longer rely on information I might have explicitly put down, would she be the one to say enough is enough, if enough truly was excessive? Would her love for me allow her to ever give up and call in the reaper? The centrality of using agents to make healthcare decisions about patients rests on their assumed selflessness and benevolence. Not all proxies fit the model of loving, caring people who specially cherish the patient's interests wrote well-known oncologist and writer Ezekiel Emanuel in response to an article favoring proxies over advanced directives. Financial conflicts of interest arise fairly commonly at the end of life, though frequently surrogates are careful not to bring them up in front of physicians. However, I do remember an instance when I was taking care of a man who had finally succumbed to heart and lung disease, his sister had durable power of attorney and when we talked to her it was very clear that the patient would not want any aggressive management at all, so we started to make a transition toward withdrawing life support. While everything was all set, the sister did not appear quite ready and requested more time. This was something I happily acquiesced to, because transitioning from full guns blazing to a ceasefire can be traumatic, the constant flow of data, the beeping alarms, the staff shuttling in and out of the room, the sight of blood and secretions, while grim and taxing, can confer a false sense of progress. Take that away, and when you just have the patient lying in their room in peace, no longer can loved ones be distracted by noise and they have to face the end head on. This, as you can imagine, is hard, which is why giving families time to adjust is the humane thing to do. As the days clicked by, though, the sister seemed to be doing fine but continued to request deference. I noticed that the only visitor she received was a middle-aged man in a suit carrying a leather briefcase. 
When I went up to meet the two together, it turned out that the visitor was in fact a lawyer, the sister was requesting time so that she could get the paperwork ready to transfer her brother's properties into her name. Needless to say, I convinced her that it was unethical to make the patient suffer needlessly against his wishes. Another question that patients need to ask themselves is whether it is even fair to place the burden of decision-making on a loved one. I will never forget a 40-year-old woman who was admitted to the medical service after throwing up blood from vessels in her stomach that had gotten enlarged from years of drinking. Because of her inability to reach sobriety, she did not meet the requirements to be placed on the transplant list. However, she was hoping that she would be able to get a big chunk of liver from her daughter instead of having to get one from the someone else. I was looking forward to meeting the daughter to discuss treatment options further, but when she showed up, I was left in utter shock. The daughter, who had been appointed the healthcare proxy by the single mother, was a 15-year-old high school student. Not only had the mother placed the entire burden of her liver disease and what were surely the last few months of her life on a girl who was not yet old enough to be considered an adult, but she had also convinced her that she should donate her liver to her, in an operation that places the donor's life at considerable risk. So many aspects of their relationship seemed to be cannibalizing at heart that it left me very disturbed. At least in theory, with a patient close to death and unable to participate in their management, the discussions are linearly approximated between the healthcare proxy and the physician. An ideal healthcare proxy would therefore be someone who knows the patient well enough that they would be able to channel their thoughts and preferences and would also be able to keep their best interest in mind even if that might mean paying the heaviest emotional price and letting go. They would be someone who would listen to physicians but also advocate loudly for the patient. Furthermore, it would be important for them to have some basic medical knowledge about the patient's condition, treatment options, and prognosis. Studies in both the United States and Europe, however, have shown that even among those surrogates who self-report good comprehension of the medical issues pertaining to their loved one, half lack adequate knowledge about the patient's condition and severity of illness. Interestingly, a college education does not improve objective understanding of relevant medical issues. As can be easily imagined, very few patients have access to any one person who embodies all of these requirements. Surrogates are smart, though, and knowing this reality they frequently employ a zone defense approach. Healthcare proxies are rarely by themselves and are frequently one of several family members and friends deeply involved in the final deathly dialogue. Surrogates leverage resources, emotional and intellectual, from many people to help move things along. Every family, though, is different, and nowhere do these differences come into sharper focus than when they are negotiating the final rights of one of their own. Thank you for listening, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel.